Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. In late February, Dr. Brian King, the new director of FDA Center for Tobacco Products, gave a live interview to the American Vapor Manufacturers Association, a nonprofit advocacy group that supports the vaping industry in the United States. The interview was both frustrating and revealing at the same time. Joining us today to discuss the ins and outs of the interview and the aftermath is Allison Buchner, Vice President at the AVM and Marketing and Communications Director for eSig Charleston. Allie, thanks for joining us today on RugWatch. Thank you so much for having me, Brent. That's my pleasure. Before we dive into Dr. King's interview, tell our audience a bit about your background and what brought you to vaping. Um, well, so I moved to South Carolina from New York. Um, I lived in New York my entire life. Um, I was 31 years old. Um, when I was um, 30 years old, I had a blood clot in my leg um, from smoking. So I had to try everything to quit. Um, it was an awful situation. I was on blood thinners for about six months, giving myself a shot twice a day in my stomach. Um, tried Chantix, tried patches, tried gum. I, tr- I tried everything that was available and, and nothing really worked. Um, and it was kind of, you know, a hard time that I was going through in life making that move, um, which was unexpected for me, um, a lot of life changes. So when I moved to South Carolina, you know, <clears throat> cigarettes are cheaper. So yeah, let's smoke more of those because that's a really great decision to make. Um, but, you know, going through a stressful situation in life. And I think that when you do try, you know, to quit smoking and you and you are frustrated because you're not having any success with the, you know, appropriate aids that are supposed to help you get off cigarettes, kind of forget about everything you went through when you were going through that crisis with your health and you focus on what's in front of you and your day-to-day life and and you go right back to smoking cigarettes when when that replacement therapy isn't working um so when i moved to south carolina um i moved here with my son at the time he was six so you know stressful move just me and him (laughs) i didn't know a single person in south carolina and i was looking for a job and I found a job at a tanning salon, which I'm like, I had worked for Verizon Wireless for years. I was a marketing specialist for them. So I'm like, this is easy, fun job. And it'll just get me some income until I can find a job that's got more longevity, you know, and I can use my skill set for. Um, so I just figured it'd be something fun, kind of light, you know. So that's what I was doing. Um, and the owners um, actually owned a hair salon that was connected to the tanning salon. And they were vaping. And they had this little tiny box of vapes and they would offer these vapes, little starter kits, little 650 battery tank and a, a liquid and a menthol or a, or a regular tobacco flavor and an 18 milligram. Cause they were trying to get all their customers that smoked off of smoking and, and to start vaping. Cause they were both two plus a day pack smokers and this worked for them. So they were like, we're gonna do this. So long story short <laughs> 11 years later i still work for the same company um they transitioned that first uh hair salon slash tanning salon into a vape shop and now there's 16 other locations and i and i work in marketing and communications for them now um so you know and i actually you know got you know she's like do you smoke and i'm like yeah and she's like do you want to try this I said, sure she gave me like a pina colada and an 18 and you know little my start set up and And that was it. I never touched another cigarette. And I was shocked. I think that I honestly think the reason that so many people and advocates are so passionate is because it's shocking how easy it is when you've tried other methods to quit. So, I mean, I I've been a lifelong, you know, now like supporter of this, you know, ever since I found it and, you know, wanting to share this information, you know, as much as I can. And for the first few years I worked for the company, I, I managed one of their busiest locations, um, which happened to be a newer location that they had opened up closer to where I live. And every single person that walked in the door for those four years that I ran that store, they were quitting smoking. This is really before it got like, you know, to be popular or it was the cloud chasing or whatever. These were just smokers that wanted to quit. They heard good things about vaping and they wanted to check it out. So that changed my life a lot too, because I've literally had customers come around the counter and hug me and say, Hey, I just went to my doctor and you know, my test results for all of these things are so much better. And I can't believe you finally got me to quit smoking. I mean, the first car I bought down here, the guy didn't even take a commission on the sale because he's like, this, this woman saved my life, stopped me from smoking two and a half packs a day of, of, you know, Marlboro menthols. And so 
it was a great thing when I first got involved in it. So to now be at this point where I've been with the company for 11 years, to see the attitude towards vaping change and to see people that I've helped quit go back to smoking because of all the stuff that's, you know, being put out into the, into the, into the universe here from, you know, public health, it's, it's really upsetting and frustrating. And so it's kind of pushed me into this advocate, you know, advocation, you know, of where I'm like, now this is like my passion and, and, you know, and it's kind of taken over my entire life because I'm so passionate about it because I've seen what it can do and what it could do if it was just allowed to do it, you know, properly. So what exactly is AVM and what do they do? So American Vapor Manufacturers, um, it's a nonprofit organization. Um, you know, they have, you know, strategies put together to try to help, you know, Americans have the access to the vapor products and also at the same time, you know, kind of protect the manufacturers that make these products. We try to stay on top of these burden some, you know, federal regulations and try to open up lines of communication and kind of have our voices heard. Um, you know, uh, we launched this year the Right to Switch campaign um, to rally the industry to fund like a comprehensive effort to maintain uh, legal and regulatory viability of vaporing products, and which we all know could save hundreds of thousands of smokers from an early death. Um, and, and we just personally feel that no one should be denied access to these, you know, potentially life-saving, you know, treatments. And, you know, smokers should never be prevented from using vaping products to, to quit combustible cigarettes. Now, you mentioned uh, basically what we call the war on vaping. Uh, who's responsible for that? <sighs> Ah, well, I mean, I guess I think it's a combination of things. I think it's a, you know, combination of, you know, public health for sure. Public enemy number one, I think, against vaping, which is which is just kind of mind blowing. I, I think it, if you look at it, it's become like a a political issue when I think it's a it's a public health issue. And it, that's what it should be based on. Um, you know, I mean, FDA at the end of the day has full authority to regulate. That's how they see fit. Um, and unfortunately, I think without even saying it, they've, they've you know, created a, a flavor ban, um, but they're just not kind of going through the process that they're supposed to do if they create a new rule, like no flavors. Um, but we see that they're not approving any flavors. Um, you also have, you know, campaign for tobacco free kids. You have the truth initiative where it's constantly, you know, kind of shoved down your throat of all these horrible things, which I brought up in the King interview of, you know, parasites crawling through your skin and metal dragons coming out of your lungs. Um, obviously, I personally think if I was a smoker and I saw something like that on TV, I would definitely not want to try it. So I think that at the end of the day, I think, you know, these things are obviously funded by the FDA. The information comes from public health. So I think that that is the main issue is that public health is just not being honest about a tobacco harm reduction. So we should probably contextualize a little bit uh, for the audience about who Dr. King is. What is the CTP? They're underneath the FDA. I'll try to do a little bit. You add, of course, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration was given uh, control over the regulation of tobacco products back in 2009. And from that, they used a technique within the regulatory uh, structure to deem vaping products to be a tobacco product, thus they're being treated like a cigarette. And it created the Center for Tobacco Products. So Dr. King is the head dude on top of that. Yes. Um, I mean, obviously, it's been kind of a revolving door for the CTP. You know, you have the prior CTP director, Matthew Holman, who left to go to Philip Morris. Um, you know, um, and, you know, it's kind of crazy to think that maybe he Essentially, thought that he could do more for public health at a tobacco company than he could at the at the FDA, um, you know. And then you come in, you know, uh, Brian King, who originally was with CDC. Um, he's a scientist, as he'll tell you a few times over and over again. He'll remind you that he's a scientist, um, you know. And they are, you know. But in, at the end of the day, you know, deeming something appropriate for public health that they can base that decision on on anything. And I, I don't feel that they're basing the decisions that they're making on on science and data. I think they're basing it on this, you know, campaign to protect the children um, 
from vaping, but at the same time, you know, cigarette smoking for, for youth is at an all time low. Um, and, and it's not really ticking back up for smoking. So I, I think the gateway, um, you know, that they keep alluding to is, is obviously pretty false because we would see a, an uptick in smoking um, if that was the case, but we don't, we see, you know, teens vaping and, you know, I, Personally, I don't want any teen to vape, but if it came down to a choice between a combustible product and an e-cigarette, if they were already using a combustible product, I would say that, that vaping is a much safer avenue to take. But that being said, again, these products were not created for youth. These products were created for adult smokers. And if youth is breaking the law, then, then that should be something that's addressed separately without taking these options off the table for adults that desperately need them. So uh, we're going to play uh, the first sound bite in a second here. It was set up for us, uh, Greg Connolly, uh, your colleague there at AVM. It's you both did the questioning uh, on this interview. How did this interview get set up? Well, it started um, before I came on at AVM. Um, I know that they were kind of trying to get the FDA to to put a date on on the calendar, to choose a date and to lock it in so we could have an interview with them. Um, you know, much easier task for groups like PAVE and com Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids who were actually sought out by, you know, CTP to have these interviews. We kind of had to keep asking. I think it was about six to eight months that they were kind of um, trying to get this on the books. Um, and so it kind of happened. And I was told about it, like right after I came on board that this would be happening. So it was... Um, you know, a lot of practice, a lot of, you know, watching interviews with them, which I'm sure they did the same with us, you know, to see what kind of questioning they that they ask and what kind of questions hadn't been covered yet, um, you know, and how they were going to respond. So then we could kind of respond in turn to that. Um, but it wasn't anything groundbreaking, a few great things that we did get out of the interview. But I think as everybody knew, it was going to kind of be that copy and paste answering that we always get from the FDA. Well, let's take a listen uh, to the first portion of the interview. CTP has been describing teen vaping as an epidemic since 2018, um, a word that was chosen using focus groups to heighten the emotional reaction. Um, but since then, teen vaping has plummeted, and today, fewer than 3% of teens vape daily. That's not what the word epidemic means, not clinically, not scientifically, and not in common sense. So how do you expect to be taken seriously by the public as a scientific agency when you continue to use a flatly erroneous term like that? Yeah, so I'm, I believe you're speaking about the CDC, um, and FDA has not used that terminology to use the most recent um, uh, estimates of youth use. Um, I will say um, that I'm an epidemiologist by training, um, so I'm fully cognizant of the definition of an epidemic, um, which is unprecedented increases over what you'd expected baseline. Um, that said, I, I think um, and know that the science has shown a decline in the number of youth users, and, and that's a good thing. Um, over the past couple of years, um, we have seen declines since the peak in 2019. It's still too high. We've got two and a half million um, kids that are still using these products. And based on what we're seeing with other products among kids, including cigarettes um, and, and smokeless and, and, and others, we we can achieve those low levels as well, you know, below 2%, you know, one per 2%. Um, I do disagree with the notion that we should only be um, concerned with daily use among kids. Um, we do have research that demonstrate even infrequent use um, elicit signs and symptoms of dependency. Um, and so from um, uh, my perspective, any youth use of these products is problematic and that, you know, that's how you become a frequent user is, is there's a pathway from intermediary to frequent use. Um, but, you know, regardless, the good news is that it's coming down I hope that that continues. We certainly have the pandemic effect, which has affected everything, right? We, we see it on a variety of health indicators. So it's interesting to see next year once, you know, kids are now back in school um, more frequently um, and there's potential social sources, whether uh, we see a change in that use. But I, I hope it continues to decline. Um, and as, as I've noted, um, you know, previously, I, I see where we can go based on the use of other products. And I'm hopeful that we can continue um, these types of, of interventions to continue to reduce use use. But it's not mutually exclusive from actions to help um, uh, continue um, um, to address the issue of, of um, harm reduction among adult smokers and, and getting them to quit completely. So, you so on your watch, sorry, Allison, so on your watch, uh, the FDA has decided to no longer use the term epidemic? 
Um, since I've started, I, I I haven't uttered it. I'm not aware of any of my staff, um, but um, as as far as I'm aware, um, you know, we we have not used the term. Um, you know, it's ultimately up to respective individuals. Um, there's certainly um, disagreements among epidemiologists, like there is any discipline. You're going to find people disagree. Um, but in terms of of the big picture issue, I don't want us to see the forest beyond the trees. And the bottom line is that there's still too many kids using these products. And so whatever you call it, we've got two and a half million kids using the products, and we can do better. Um, in terms of reducing them. Um, and so I don't want us to get caught up in semantics so much as the big picture. And, and for me, um, we've got more work to do. We've made good progress, um, but we've got to continue to the pedal to the metal while still keeping an open mind around strategies continue uh, to, to benefit adult smokers to get them to quit completely. So Allie, uh, what did you make of Dr. King's comments there? And let's start at kind of at the end. Do you believe that they actually have concern for adult smokers? No. No, I don't. Um, I, I mean, I would genuinely love to, you know, to believe that they do, but I think everything that they're doing is showing the complete and total opposite of that. I mean, I, I, they're not really taking us into consideration. They're not asking us the questions. I mean, the fact that we had to fight to even have a conversation with them, you know, kind of shows that. And, you know, I, I just don't really see the concern because at the end of the day, if the concern was truly there, you wouldn't be removing these products from the market for adults. You'd be trying to come to some kind of common ground where we save these, you know, for adults, but we have more protocols put into place to, you know, have the youth not have access to it, which I know that every single manufacturer, you know, storefront owner would be happy to comply with and already is complying with. I mean, I know for us, you know, we can't even make a sale unless we scan an ID. Our system is set up that way, so it won't sell anything or even work if an ID is not scanned, um, you know, as a fail-proof, but that's not something that's even taken into consideration because these applications are just being denied and, and you don't even have an option to get to that point, even if you do include that information in your, you know, submission, which I feel is, is the key, right? I mean, making sure that there's safeguards in place so kids cannot get this from from that particular shop. Yeah, definitely go after the people that are not doing the right thing. But by shutting everybody down and denying 99.9% .9 of applications, you're not showing any regard for adults because you're approving products that adults are not using. What about his, his demeanor? Uh, because... Oh, well, it's just semantics, this epidemic issue. Meanwhile, it's a word that's been used since 2018 when then Commissioner Scott Gottlieb said that there was an epidemic of teen vaping that posed a clear and present danger. Those are immensely strong words to come from the largest public health organization in the United States. So FDA and CTP did push the epidemic term for years. Well, I mean, I don't believe, you know, that they believe that there is, you know, an epidemic anymore, as we've clearly, you know, asked him directly. And he said that he understands the definition of epidemic and that what's happening now isn't an epidemic. So is it so far fetched to believe that T21 is working? They just had to give it time to work and potentially you know, all of these numbers have dwindled down because of that fact. I mean, I, I personally, for me, I think that you see a lot more 18 year olds potentially hanging out with 16, 17 year olds than you see 21 year olds. So, you know, maybe that was a solution that worked, um, but they just didn't really give it time to work. Um, I don't think that it's, you know, a, you know, credited to the scare campaigns. Um, I think, you know, Personally, with the D.A.R.E. campaign, all that did was make me more interested in things that had never been introduced to me before. So I don't think that the campaigns are, are, are what's been successful. I think it's been, you know, vape shops raising the age to 21, IDing everyone that comes in the door, knowing that this is the number one issue that the FDA CTP has had with vaping products. So we're trying to do the right thing to prove that we're not part of the problem but I don't think that that really matters. And, and if it truly was about health and it truly was about adults, then, then I think that they would take a look at that data and, and come to a different conclusion. Yeah, I agree. 
I think it's troublesome to uh, state that, you know, 2.5 million teens, youth that are using the products is still, you know, very bad, you know. Well, wait a minute. That's a, a huge, massive reduction over what it was in 2019 and 2020 when, the, you know, those years were really quite bad. And then let me just add, and uh, he did address it kind of at the start, um, but um, it's like one time in 30 days. Well, that's the whole point. One time. I, I mean, what what is that? I mean, every kid's going to try things that they see adults doing. That, we've all done that. I think a lot of people lose sight of the fact that we've all done that. Um, but that doesn't make you a user of the product. That makes you somebody who tried it because your friend had it or you were curious about it. So you grabbed it from your mom's purse and took a puff. That doesn't make you a user. So what about the success stories of adults that have actually been like me, smoked for 17 years and finally put down cigarettes? And this is the only avenue I have that's been successful. And now you want to take that away from me. While you were at the CDC in the mid-2010s, many people's first introduction to you came when, along with Dr. Tom Frieden, you started to voice warnings that vaping products could serve as a gateway to combustible cigarette smoking. Today, of course, high school cigarette smoking is at 2%, a figure that no doubt would have inspired great laughs at any tobacco control conference in 2010 if you predicted that's where we'd be at today. Uh, Because back then, one in seven high school youth smoked cigarettes. So with the benefit of seven, eight years of hindsight, in your view, is it a fair conclusion that any gateway into smoking over the last decade has likely been outsized numerically by the gateway out of smoking for youth and young adults? I will say that there's still um, a strong body of evidence that suggests that the gateway does a f- does exist, um, but it's dependent on a variety of different factors. It's certainly not conclusive evidence, um, but there's a moderate evidence to demonstrate that. But you also have to use look at the net impact of the science. And so I've said publicly many times um, that you do have some gateway effect. We've seen that through the PATH study and others, but that doesn't mean that every single kid who's using an e-cigarette is going to go on to smoke. Um, there's a variety of factors that that impact that. So um, I caution folks against, um, you know, definitive statements like that, that every person is going to transition who use the products. It's certainly happening. But when you look at the net effect, we've we've definitely seen a decline in overall e-cigarette use. But that doesn't negate the fact that there still may be some kids who are using e-cigarettes that are transitioning to cigarettes. Um, But the net effect at present, um, we are seeing a decline in use. And as I noted earlier, I I hope that that continues among kids. It's it's a good thing, um, but we we can do better. Yeah, and everything that, or much of your day is spent looking at the 100 word statute that's known as the appropriate for the protection of public health test for the PMTA, for PMTA reviews. Um, this is a question kind of inspired by thoughts of Dr. David Abrams, former, formerly of the Truth Initiative, people like David Levy. Um, does the appropriate for the protection of public health statute require FDA to view teens switching away from cigarettes to vaping as a bad thing? I think that there's a lot of interpretations of APPH, and I think that we have opportunities to continue to to clarify um, the the scope of that. I know there's been a lot of calls in the past. Um, I I do hope for opportunities in the future where we can have public engagement um, on entities um, to identify um, perspectives um, related to um, the the, um, precision around the APPH standard. So you don't don't really necessarily answer the question. Do you think the APPH statute requires FDA to say any teen use of any nicotine product, including a switch from cigarettes to vaping, is a bad thing. Is that required by the statute or is that a policy-based decision? The statute requires us to look at the net benefits and risk when we are making a decision on a PMTA. And that includes evaluating the benefits to adult smokers, but also the net risk to kids. And so we are required to look um, at that relationship. And so in terms of determining the APPH standard, we have to look at the net impact among non-users and, and that includes youth, which is a vulnerable population. I didn't realize youth just as a whole, as a category, is vulnerable. You know, they try to say there's this gateway, you know, from vaping to smoking for youth, but we see really low numbers in youth smoking at this point. Um, And, and, you know, yeah, and also lower numbers now, you know, of vaping. But I would think that if that was, was true, then we would see an uptick in smoking as well. And we're not seeing that. 
So in a way, Dr. King here said two things at the, you know, at once. One, they recognize that there are less teens smoking, but there is still a gateway. But he provided no proof of that. Right. I think a lot of these uh, statements that come from the FDA don't have any data to back them up, um, which is unfortunate and extremely frustrating for us because, you know, we're trying to have an open dialogue here for the first time. Um, and we're trying to get some information on, on how they make their decision making and how they come to these conclusions. And and they're just kind of repeating the same stuff that they've been saying, even though the numbers don't reflect that they keep kind of saying these things that we know are not true and they're not backing it up with any data. And the other thing I find very shocking about this, but it's very typical of a regulator is that when they want to, they'll always refer back to Congress, to the legislature and say, well, we're just following what they told us. And they're the ones that set out the parameters and us as good regulators just have to follow that. But no, that's not correct. The regulator Certainly, even when it comes to what's appropriate for the protection of public health, it's the regulator that decides that. The regulator can weight things however they want. They go back to the legislature and say, this stuff meets our standard. The whole point of the regulator doing this work and not the legislature is that, is that they do that. Right. And they're supposed to regulate it based on science and data, not based on getting political pressure from, you know, the Dick Durbins and, you know, and, and of the world and the Bloombergs, it's, it's very frustrating for us because, you know, we can provide the data, we can provide, you know, the stats, we can show how many people come into our stores and what they buy and what they prefer, what actually works for them, which, which should be along with the, you know, testing and everything else that we have to do on our liquids, that should be enough to prove that these are needed and, and not only that, but if, if smoking is public enemy number one and, and public health wants to get rid of smoking, then there should be more approvals. There should be more clear standards um, and, and clear guidelines of how you actually successfully complete a PMTA so we can help our adult customers. Because I think there's a, a, a misconception that you know the vape industry doesn't wanna be regulated and that's not true. We wanna be regulated but we want fair regulations. We want regulations based on science and data and clear you know, directions on how to get an approval like that. But there is no clear direction because there, there is no way to get an approval if, if you're not you know, one of the larger companies with uh, you know, an, unfortunately a tobacco flavored product. Now, Claude Bates has come out with a, a great line. We just had him on the show. Um, and let me try to get this word for word. If you are a new, think of a microbrew beer, you know, so some local microbrewery comes out with a new beer. There isn't some regulator that they have to prove to the regulator that this new beer is appropriate for the protection of public health. It's just a new beer. Right. It's an adult choice. You have to be 21 to purchase it. it if, if alcohol had to be appropriate for public health, there would be no alcohol on the shelves because alcohol is a lot more damaging than any of these products that we're trying to get approved. I mean, I think it's one of the most, you know, difficult processes to even go through. Um, I don't know many, you know, industries at all that have to jump through these hoops and, and it's, it's to get an approval. Yes, but a, that's not a permanent approval. You know, you have to stay approved. You have to continue to show why you're appropriate for public health. And at any moment, the FDA could make a change and your product could then be eliminated from being approved and, and go back into a denial. So it's it's really difficult to keep these products um, available, even if you do have an, an approval from the FDA. A lot of my customers, this is just a personal thing that I've noticed, um, are all ex-smokers and they are furious because CTP is banned or they're afraid that they will ban their preferred vaping product um, through the broken PMTA process. And they want to know, honestly, do you want them to start smoking again? Because that's how it feels to them. 
Yeah, so absolutely not. Um, I, I've noted this several times in, in the public um, that uh, there, there's a net benefit to the individual. If you transition completely, we do not want you to go back um, to smoking. It's 7,000 chemicals and, and 70 carcinogens harming nearly every organ of your body. If you have quit completely, that's a good thing. And congratulations and, and, and keep it up. Um, so we definitely don't want people to go back, but it's important to understand the complexities of the environment that we're working in when it comes to our regulatory authorities. And so Congress has mandated me to do certain things in terms of reviewing applications, enforcement and compliance activities. And so this is not an individual basis vendetta against folks. It's ensuring that we enforce the law. And so from our standpoint, I'm committed to ensuring we ramp up efforts to make sure that we're reviewing those applications in a way that we can authorize those products to meet the bar. But on balance, that doesn't mean that we can be remiss on the enforcement and compliance. And so fully acknowledge people are quitting with e-cigarettes. That's a good thing. Um, but with the parameters that we have, we have specific requirements um, and we can certainly make improvements. And I'm committed to making sure we have those efficiencies um, uh, moving forward and, and the best flexibilities um, to ensure that people are able to get authorized products um, into their, their hands um, to uh, continue use um, uh, for the purposes of either quitting completely or, or significantly reducing the amount they're smoking. Personally, for me, I, I mean, I, I've seen kind of like a turnaround for people, and this is something I just dealt with very recently. But, you know, there are people that I, I consider success stories. Um, you know, a couple of my neighbors that smoked for a long term um, quit smoking. Um, you know, one person in general, um, you know, that I had uh, in an altercation with this weekend um, at the pool trying to enjoy my day off. Um, has gone back to smoking and, you know, brought it up to me. Oh, I was on that e-cig for five years and, you know, I'm smoking again. And, um, um, you know, she's dating someone that's a, as a smoker and he kind of came at me and was like, well, these are just as bad as smoking cigarettes. And I'm like, but they're not. And, you know, I'm trying to explain to him because you can tell that she really wants to not be smoking. Um, but he's kind of maybe beat it into her head that this is just as bad as, smoking and, and it's kind of a, a, a crutch for somebody who is a smoker that doesn't want to quit because they look at this misinformation and this stuff that they see on TV that's technically, you know, only supposed to be seen by kids, but it's not because it's affecting adults. And it's all day long, you know, as the communications director for the company I work for, these are the emails I get on Facebook. These are the messages I get on help desk. I'm seeing this, I'm seeing that. So instead of just being able to help someone quit smoking nowadays, you have to have data, science, reports printed in stores because these customers come in with a laundry list of concerns. And, and typically the reason that they even came in the door at this point is because they have a friend that vaping worked for and they heard their personal stories and it kind of, okay, fine, I'll go check it out. But they have this list and I'm physically sometimes will come in with a list of questions of things that they hear, you know, metal parts in my lungs and, you know, a popcorn lung, which is still, you know, around, you know, that they're still talking about and, you know, concerns that, you know, I'm not going to, you know, be any healthier if I make this switch. And so as a, as a former smoker, any excuse I could get to, to keep smoking, I was going to use that because everyone's trying to get you to quit, right? Everyone's like, that's so bad for you. You should stop smoking. So if you have a reason to say, I shouldn't even try that because it's just as bad, that's something that some people are going to hold on to. And that makes me really sad because, you know, I saw somebody that I helped quit smoking. They were vaping for five years. And the biggest issue that they had was that they weren't able to bring their nicotine level down. But now they're back to smoking a pack and a half a day. So now they're going above that nicotine level and also getting all the carcinogens and tar and, and nasty chemicals you get with combustible cigarettes. And it's it's very upsetting for someone like me because I, I you know, I looked at that like I, I got you off of smoking five years and now you're back. And this is all thanks to the information coming out of public health. There is no other explanation for the fear that has now forced you back to smoking cigarettes. Ali, one of the things that we tend to hear all the time, and there certainly was a lot of that in this interview, it's it's a double-edged sword kind of thing when it comes to the regulator. They say that they don't have the science yet to show that these products are effective, and I use the word safe, um, but then they also say that they don't have the science that proves that they are causing the kind of harms that are alluded to. Basically, 
the people that do the science that are in charge of the regulating seem to not have the science. Is that the case? Well, no. I mean, <laughs> as AVM released, you know, the information, you know, in March, you know, that we got from a report from March of 2020, um, you know, in a FOIA request, you know, these reports found that the science was already internally there at the FDA, where 75% of adults use flavors to stay off combustible cigarettes. Smokers prefer vaping over NRTs as cessation aids, and there was and still is no evidence linking vaping to cancer or any respiratory diseases, including a valley. So in short, the report offers concrete evidence that the FDA's vape vaping regulations are not based on sound science or a desire to improve the health of adult smokers who rely on these products to stay off of cigarettes. Um, and I know for myself, and, and I'm sure vapors everywhere are furious that the FDA has internally acknowledged the benefits of these flavored vaping products while deeming all of them not appropriate for public health. They, ha they have that data, they know the truth, yet they still refuse to do anything about it. So tell us a bit more about these documents uh, that were, so what, who did the FOIA request? Was it uh, a lawsuit? And is this really a smoking gun? I mean, the requests were done by Greg Connolly um, and then, you know, kind of sorted through by AVM's team. Um, and I think, you know, the main, you know, t the main key points that were made were that, you know, 75% of adults use flavors other than tobacco to stay off combustible cigarettes. I mean, that's a huge thing because when you see the FDA only approving tobacco products that are tobacco flavored, <laughs> um, you, knowing that 75% of the people that are using these, legally using these products, prefer other flavors than tobacco, you wonder if they even want to get people to stop smoking at that point because they know the data is there. They have it in-house. They've done the work. So why the denial? It just, it doesn't make any sense. And let me ask you, Ali, uh, something that I, I don't think we talk about enough, that it's not just the fact that vapors prefer flavors and they work better, you know, to get somebody to actually quit and stay quit. But the flavors are also instrumental in having a very strong and vibrant retail business. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. None of us could survive if the only thing that was left on the shelf was tobacco flavors. That's right. And I mean, why aren't we talking about that enough? Well, I think we're trying to prove that, you know, I mean, I know that for us, when we filed our PMTA, we pulled, um, you know, from when T21 went into effect until now, all of our adult, you know, purchasers that are coming in. And I think it was 2.9% of all 16 locations, which is a, a lot of consumers are buying tobacco flavors. Now, there are some people that genuinely enjoy tobacco flavors, but for, for me personally, you know, when you quit smoking, taste buds come back stronger, your sense of smell is increased. And anything that really tasted like a cigarette to me was almost a trigger to make me want to go light a cigarette. So when I finally moved over to flavors, and I think it took about two weeks for me, which is I think the average for most people that come into our stores is what we saw. That's what they do. And so that's also what keeps them successful because if I'm tired of vaping on a strawberry flavor, I can come in and there's an entire menu of other flavors I can try. So not only does it keep it fun, keeps it interesting, stops people from getting bored with what they're doing. And if they find something that they like even better, that's more incentive to keep them vaping and not going back to smoking. Yeah, I found personally when I quit uh, with using vape, it was that there was a kind of a taste culture. I felt like a wine connoisseur, just about vape juice. Absolutely. And a new flavor comes out and you're like, oh, I can't wait to get there and try it. And unfortunately, there is no new flavors anymore because because we're not allowed to be innovative anymore. And and that's a part of, you know, the industry that I really miss is the new flavors coming out and, you know, getting to try them and, and seeing the adult consumers get excited because we're announcing a new flavor that we're making, um, you know, and, and they truly get excited about it. You know, oh, well, at night I vape my dessert flavor because at night's when I crave sweets, but during the day I use a minty flavor, you know, or whatever, however it's working for you. The more the options that we take away, the less success that there will be, especially I think long-term success.
Ali, two weeks ago, the Fifth Circuit Court took FDA to task over PMTA and non-tobacco flavors. Is this a win? Is it real? I mean, it's certainly real. I, I hate to say anything's a win because I think I've learned my lesson about getting too excited about anything that happens. Um, but yeah, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, you know, recently issued an opinion in this case, and it really did criticize the FDA for allegedly abusing its regulatory authority and employing a flawed decision-making process. I mean, specifically, the court found that the FDA had failed to adequately consider the potential benefits of the VUE's menthol e-cigarette as harm reduction um, for adult smokers and instead focused solely which we see all the time on the potential risks to youth. Um, the court also criticized the FDA for allegedly violating due process by selectively enforcing its regulations and for failing to provide clear and consistent regulatory framework for e-cigarettes. So yeah, I think that's big. Um, you know, they also violated the notice and comment requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act. Like, you know, these are big things that kind of, I feel like the FDA is just kind of bypassing the due diligence of what they're supposed to be doing and kind of just making these, you know, almost making these decisions to appease, you know, these these, you know, constant letters that they're getting from these political, you know, sides where they're demanding more enforcement or demanding to take flavors away. But, you know, the FDA is supposed to go by the science and stand by the science, whether it upsets you know, Dick Durbin or not, like th this is what they're there for. This is a scientific process. Um, and in addition, which I think was a huge win for vapors, you know, they they quoted Alex Norcia at Filter Magazine, who, you know, was a big champion for us for, you know, many years. You know, and this memo showed that the FDA had initially considered potential health benefits of menthol e-cigarettes, but ultimately decided not to factor them into their decision making process. So how, how did you come to that decision? Where is the science to back up that decision making? And so, yeah, of course, anytime the FDA gets, you know, called on their stuff from people that's, you know, not us, you know, from our mom's basements tweeting him, um, you know, I think that it's a win because that is getting attention. Those decisions that they're making and the kind of corner cutting that they're doing is getting attention. And, and I think that it's good for us because it's, finally shedding some light on things that we've been seeing and we've been really frustrated by for a long time now. So what's the end result then from that ruling? Well, they did find that it was arbitrary and capricious, um, that they had failed to provide, you know, the explanation for their actions. Um, and the court, it's just one decision in a larger legal regulatory landscape surrounding e-cigarettes and tobacco products. The FDA has the broad authority to regulate these products but they're not balancing public health and safety concerns with the potential benefits that these products offer to adult users. Um, you know, t in my opinion, personally, I mean, the, to the issues raised in this case are controversial and they're going to come, become the subject of legal and policy debate for a long time because, you know, ultimately they get to keep their products on the, on the shelf and, and, you know, they live to fight another day which would be great if that was happening for, for everyone, you know, great for them, but it would be great for if that was happening for everyone else as well, because, and I do think that maybe that could start a trend if, you know, the courts keep ruling in favor of companies like this.